And welcome to another great episode of Tampa Fishing Outfitters Fishing Report. Right here at Tampa Fishing Outfitters, James Beers, hey, hey. the man Back in the again. house, Shorty, a.k.a. Tarpon Slayer, a.k.a. Okay. Flat Bill Friday, <laughs> whatever else we're going to call it. The Whiting Waxer. Uh, yeah, the, the Whiting was the ticket, bro. That's that's probably what I'm known for the most is the, the Whiting. whiting. Yeah. whiting is <laughs> I've been referring good. all the trips for Whiting to all you. All the Whiting so. requests, dude. Hey. I'm on it. Listen, Travis, you never know, buddy. If I'll they can glorify a cast net and bait like they do now, hey, bro, Whiting could be the next tarpon. I'm in on it. It's, I'm the, in next, on it. it's the next Silver King. That's right. <laughs> Snapper, the other redfish. Speaking of Silver King, what are we going to talk about tonight? We are. We're going to talk a little bit about tarpon. We're going to talk a little bit about what's going on inshore. Yeah. I, I still haven't made the full transition yet to bait fishing and, and doing the tarpon thing. But uh, it's – hang on, guys. It's right around the corner, and – um. So we're going to talk a little bit about today some of the stuff, some of the gear you might use, some of the setups that you might use for tarpon because it can get complex depending on what you're doing. If you're throwing it's artificials, if you're, yeah. if you're throwing live bait, if you're throwing fish. cut bait, you know, there's a whole arsenal of things that you may want to have on the boat yeah. to be prepared for different areas that you fish or different types sure. of, of fish that you're fishing, you know. Baits so, you're fishing with. Baits and so... You know, we always talk every year how much preparation is involved with running a, a, a real solid tarpon trip. I mean, mm -hmm. you really want to have all the baits mm -hmm. to be completely prepared. you got to have everything. That's the crabs. That's the live bait. That's the dead bait. Yeah. You know, there's some artificials. There's times where, where we've thrown artificials on fish, having cut bait or live baits out and hooked up on the artificials, right. you know, one-to-one -one with, with the live baits or even better on, on artificials because – you can keep the bait in the strike zone exactly or put the bait in the strike zone uh when it appears you know so we'll talk a little bit about what we got here on the table in front of us but in the meantime let's talk a little bit about what all three of us been doing the last you know i'd say month two months really is uh the inshore bite and so it still continues to be pretty good uh i think it's a ti really a title driven thing right yeah. now you know at least the bite anyway mm -hmm. There's always some fish to be had, but I think the the quality game fish have been showing up on certain tides. I think it's been a real indicator of, of what's happening inshore to kind of push me, you know, right. out into the bay. So I, Yeah, I think we're kind of in, in limbo. We're in transition. I think, you, especially with the snook, uh, our red fishing continues to be so-so at best. I've caught mm -hmm. some nice reds. Um, it's been a lot of work. Uh, we got on redfish actually – kind of good a certain spot i've got them dialed in pretty well as far as change of the tide two mm -hmm. hours to hit them yeah it's a little school fish the best thing about it and i and i haven't fished them in the last three days or so just because i haven't ran it's not on the south shore but uh the good thing about it is you can't see them they're sitting in a pothole and if you don't know they're there forget you it I, you, I seen them one time they rose up as a small school mm -hmm. uh, but we had some going 34 inches um but they'll hump down but they don't move, which is great, so you don't have to chase them. Yeah. As long as you sit there. Happy you fish. Catch them. Yeah. Happy and fish. And they're happy fish. Um, so, but, you know, I posted some pictures on my on my uh, Steady Action page, uh, Facebook page of some good redfish days. Uh, that, by by any means, doesn't mean it's good red fishing. It just means right. I had a good day You're red fishing. You're getting some redfish. Yeah. yeah. We're, it, it was a good day of redfish yeah. that day. But um, to say that I've seen big schools, we're in May. We should see some schools. Yeah. Right. Far few in between. I think the fish that we're catching mostly are beating the bushes. Yeah. Uh, fishing the mangrove lines, hitting the onesies, twosies. I, I, and we <coughs> chimed in on reds, and I know we'll be talking tarpon, but uh, uh, there's a lot of chatter going on within the Florida guides, and, and Dave Marquette put something that was uh, very educated out there as far as uh, some stuff going on with redfish, um, some meetings happening and, and looking into it. and. Uh, I'm curious to see what comes out of it. Yeah. Because I'm on the fence on do we have a lot of fish or the fish just doing different stuff. Uh, maybe we should poke out there on a full moon night. We might see a lot of fish. Right. <laughs> Throwing a party. They're like, nobody's yeah. out here today. Well, and I think I think you hit the nail on the head, and that's something that I certainly believe is it's a combination of a lot of right. different things. Yeah. And we've talked about it several different times. But I think there's there's several different areas that we can be better at or at least take notice of. And 
take a deeper look into the situation and see if it really is affecting our fishery. Sure. And I think that not just one item to be looked at, right. whether it's harvesting, you know, whether it's illegal fishing, whether it's pressure, whether it's habitat reduction, mm-hmm. whether it's water quality, you know, all those right. different things, I think, all play a factor in where we're at today in our fishery. And the biggest thing is, is we had to recognize it. And that well, well, if enough fishery, people realize that we have an issue, then mm-hmm. we can start to figure out ways to, to yeah. One, make it they're better. just all compounding each other, so, yeah. Well, you look at the number of guides out there, um, good guides. There's a lot of new guys that are good. James, uh, you're a very good fisherman. You're you're new to the game. Uh, Ty seems to be very good out there from what I've seen. Mm-hmm. Uh, you mix that in with a lot of good anglers and a lot of people fishing. Dude, I'm telling you right now, I had to go to Pathfinder today, pick my new boat up, and I'm still waiting on a motor that I ordered in February. And this is a con- – the industry, they showed me their sheet of boats that are ordered retail order. Mm-hmm. And it was bold letters. And the sheet is Bull you full wet. of, like, retail orders. Not dealers – not filling de- sure. dealer orders. Like, boat – people going right. to the dealer and wanting a boat. And they're and I'm talking about a company that pumps out 25 a week. Mm-hmm. Like, done boats. And they're never seen anything like it. So, my point being is – there's people out there on the water. There's a lot of boats. People understand boats better. Mm-hmm. Boat companies have made boats more efficient to run flats. There's a lot of deciding factors to, A, for more fish to be killed and caught, B, to be pushed off to somewhere else. Yeah. So I, I'm curious to see uh, what happens, especially with the redfish. I think our trout fishing this year, I'm, I'm, I still don't think it's what it was, but, I mean, I'm I catching can tell a lot you of that, trout. I can tell you that my trout bite, and I – I just did a, a little seminar. I'm going to let you talk a little bit, James, because I want to hear your opinion on, on some of this. Um, but the big trout, you know, the the larger trout, when I say big trout, I'm talking about trout over 22 inches. Mm-hmm. That starts to get to that big category. Yeah. You start pushing 25, 26, you start getting into that huge yeah. category for our side of Trophy. the Trophy. You know, for our side of the state. And uh, we've certainly had our opportunities at, a, at quite a few of those big fish, taken advantage of the opportunity several times and, and landed some of those nice big fish picture release type thing but it's been nice to see and what's been really nice is i'm finding that in several different areas it's not like one specific area that maybe hadn't been pressured quite as much or uh, you know one area that well, had bad water and they all moved to the good water type scenario sure. i'm finding this in several different places up and along you know the south shore of tampa bay and so it's been a nice relief because we've been targeting more trout and i've been becoming a better trout fisherman for sure because of the red the redfish yeah. and not because i can't go out and catch a redfish you fished our side the mm-hmm. other day and you know got mm-hmm. on some redfish and it's not because i can't go out and catch redfish we'll still go and in i'm more kind of going to my dialed in spots where it's like okay i know that if i fish this spot normally on an outgoing tide or halfway through the outgoing or at the high tide when it starts dumping out i normally catch a few redfish but I'm not going red fishing all day no. just to target redfish. No. It's really just if we have the opportunity yeah. and the stars align yeah. for that rotation or you know that round that I'm doing that day, we'll go in and pick at some redfish. And generally, we've been catching a few, but we haven't been red fishing. I haven't been going out targeting right. redfish just for the day. And so I've been putting you know more effort towards trout and more effort towards snook uh, for the inshore bite. Right. You know, and um, so I want to pass that over to you because I know you fish a lot of the upper bay, mm-hmm. and I ran quite a few trips this month up there, and I found a pretty good trout fishery up there as well. Yeah, mainly in the deeper parts, you know, off the off the edges of the bars, but I don't fish a lot of the ponds and in pockets up there because I know it gets pretty shallow getting in. But we fished several of the you know outside sandbars that hold grass, and we we caught plenty of trout. So yeah. what are you seeing up there? Up there, you know, so. You know, really looking back three or four months ago when trout was the main, you know, it was my most targeted species, you know, um, and not from a harvest standpoint, but just from a most reliable for me up there uh, with snook mixed in. I, you know, I don't have a lot of data to compare it to in years past in the upper bay, but I have a lot of data to compare it to over my lifetime fishing Tampa Bay. I felt like I saw a lot of big trout this year come to the boat good. and get released safely. Um, so that's obviously a good sign for it. But as I move around and get to some of the places that I've fished over time, I didn't really see the numbers of, like, the keeper trout, you know, your 16, right. 17, 18-inch trout. Um, 
infrequent, but that be because I'm just exploring. Right. But, um, yeah, I, I saw big fish up there. They have a, you know, when you start to get north of the Gandy, north of the Howard, there's a lot of the terrain that I like to fish for trout, you know, if you know how to get in and out of that, sure. like you said. Um, so I think that, for me, it was taking the knowledge of the South Shore, applying it up there and saying, well, this is exactly what I'd go do if I was there, right. finding them. Right. Um, but I, w- I would say we'd more frequently see fish over 21, 22 inches than I would short fish, you know, That's 15, good. 16. That's good. You know, size up there. On some level. Yeah, on I some mean, level. You know, you need both. You need, yeah. you need a balance of both the way I understand it. But it's definitely good to see these breeder fish, you know, especially. And the reason why I, I asked the questions about Upper Tampa Bay, I enjoy fishing up there, and I fish mm-hmm. up there quite a bit, but not on a daily basis and not on any – you know, substantial basis where I could tell the difference from last week to this week exactly. to this week to that yeah, week. I know it's more mean. a seasonal thing. Okay, I know yeah. normally in the wintertime I can go fish these areas. Yeah. Normally in the spring I can go fish these areas. And a lot of that's drawn because the corporate events will run over there. And, you know, there's a lot of the times we don't have the ability to run across or I just don't want to run across. I can. Well, a four-hour trip. And a four-hour trip, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. The, it's the, been the, half the clients get a lot more fishing An hour of it's running a boat. You know, being yeah. up there. But uh, – I know that out of all the areas in Tampa Bay, that's one of the areas that water quality gets talked about more over mm-hmm. than any other place, you know, in our area. And so it's it's good to see that you're seeing large trout up there because yeah. that's the formula to success when it comes to a good trout fishery. So that's nice to see. But um, but anyway, yeah, so that's that's been good. The snook bite, I don't think we really need to go too far into detail about that. Yeah. The snook bite's been good. It's been good. I will <laughs> say that, and it has been yeah. since February, really, amongst March cold fronts and yeah. weird weather patterns. A couple but mixed in. The one thing that I <clears throat> will say about snook, and then I'll, we'll go into some tarpon uh, stuff, is I'm starting to see fish move, the bigger fish, starting to make a way off the flat mm-hmm. and sort of get in the outside of the bars and get in the trenches and start to move towards that pattern of stacking up on the passes, stacking up on some of our inshore reefs to get ready to, to do Absolutely. their spawn. And it's nice to see because that tells us that everything's going right. It's working right. Everything's yeah, working right. The system. You know, places like the river systems and some of these deep backcountry bays, these fish won't leave quite yet. Mm-hmm. But there's been quite a few, I call them herds, <laughs> yeah. that, you know, where, where you know where a big pot of fish, a big fish are, and you'll actually see them move, you know, transition out. And I'm starting to see that. So so that's cool if you're a bridge fisherman or if you like fishing those big spawning females. That's not far around the corner either. So right. keep that yeah, under. We're, we're kind of getting into that early summer. I, I'm going to uh, typically last few years and hopefully patterns follow out. I'll, I'll be catching quite a bit of overslot. Mm-hmm. Nice. I mm-hmm. uh, did pretty well last couple of years on them. So looking forward to that. Um you know the live bait uh really isn't working real good because these fish well we, this week we've dealt with quarter moon tides um not ideal tides we've fed fish ran a double the last two days but today i had to take off uh, but uh fishing through flat tides from 10 o'clock to one two o'clock is, is tough and light winds uh, <laughs> well and we had a front roll mm-hmm. through sunday so what i did notice post front bite went off mm-hmm. right get a little creative uh two days past the front not so much we had about two hours in the morning on the trip we did pretty well and then i really had to now the tribe bite was good on both trips but i literally caught four snook on the afternoon trip on the same area that i caught like 30 40 of them and then we had to move around well we got like six i think because i hit a little spurt where like had a double it's mm-hmm. like you know but it and it was slow tides late spring late weak front to come through so uh, you know, weather's gonna weather and tides are gonna predict your bite. You can you can do little tricks to kind of get the as a captain guy doing it every day. You kind of know little tricks to increase your chances, but some days they're just not gonna eat. You yeah. know, they're, they're they're so and with the pressure. So this year has been uh, one of the more challenging. It kind of reminded me when I first started guiding. There was a lot of guys on the South Shore, and um, since then I've obviously gotten better at fishing the South Shore, doing it every day. But uh, a lot of boat traffic, and uh, I I kind of. For me, I, w- I got an old theory in my head that's worked, I'd say, the last eight years, and I had to do it. Uh, just you, you learn. i tell you what fishing weekends do, do is it makes you a better fisherman. Sure. Because you have to be. Go to where nobody else is, and you'll catch fish. Yep. 
and that's what I've done. Think um, outside the pack, man. Yeah, because the because you know if you if I'm gonna use little cockroaches as an example, they get pounded. If you go to pull in little cockroach and and there's plenty of fish, plenty of spots to fish, and you see eight or nine boats within a small area, what are the chances of fish that's already been caught? Eating and, and, and the yeah. pressure that's on them. I mean, you just got to take a step back and look at situations like that and just say, it, you know, Weed Island, it's the same thing. You go in there, there's 20 boats sitting in front of Christmas Pass on a corporate event. If you're lucky. I mean, you're decreasing your chances of having a good day dramatically. Yeah. You're almost better just to go go throw uh, uh, throw something in the air at a, at a dock and mm-hmm. fish docks. You really are. Uh, and so, you know, you, you got to look at fish pressure, fish and pressure, and uh, the tide's not been – but we're going into some good tides starting to get better mm-hmm. tomorrow. So – um, starting to see some tarpon showing up, which is our topic for the night. And uh, I'm kind of geared up to do some tarpon fishing. My tarpon season this year, I, I'm, I've got a lot of trips. I've got tarpon kind of speckled in between. I, when I do tarpon fishing, I, I typically like to get on a roll, have tarpon that whole new moon week, which I mm-hmm. – and I still got some stuff open in June. But my May is like, oh, I want to do a tarpon here. I want to do a tarpon four or five days down. For me, I get I'm a rhythm type of guy. I get in a rhythm of doing something, so I'm gonna have to switch gears a lot during this month. But uh, I'm pretty excited about the tarpon season. I'm gonna do a little bit of different stuff this year. I, I look, I like fishing the beaches, but last few years with the crowds of again crowds and boats out there, uh, it's 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 become a little more of a headache than than I'm it used pull, to be. I'm gonna put one in your boat this year. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> Kate, <laughs> Clay, if Clay's watching, Clay's son Cade, he said he, he told me. Put one in your boat. I'm gonna put one in that Pathfinder. So Clay used to uh, have his son Cade. Cade's a great kid. He's getting old now. He's a teenage. But uh, me and Clay used to hang out a lot during tarpon season, and and Clay and Cade used to hook some fish in the past. Everybody be cheering him on. He's, He's like seven years old, bowed over, you know, uh-huh. leaning into it. <laughs> Kate looked over at me one day. He's Cap Jason, I'm gonna fly tarp in your boat today. Uh-huh. And I, my customers about fell out the boat <laughs> laughing. I mean, a little seven year old talking smack to me. That's but, great. Uh, yeah, so you know, tarpon season's here. Um, we're starting to see some fish. Uh, we're, we're gonna give you some basics. Um, we're gonna go over some baits, some techniques. Uh, we're gonna go over some. Uh, some things to to make things go a little smoother out there too. I'm gonna give you a little bit of information to a make preto wisdom is what it sounds okay. like coming. No, no, right. no, not I didn't say <laughs> me. I said we. <laughs> we we're gonna do you know a little bit of courtesy. Uh, uh, you know because I I will tell you during tarpon season I I'm not the guy that likes to yell at people. No. I I I've, honestly I'd say half the people that it do some dumb care. stuff out there they don't know. Right. Then the other half don't they yeah. know and they just don't care. And and half of them sometimes are charter captains. You yeah, know, really. I hate to say it. It's a free for all, man. It's um, it's just like any other part of the fishery. I've never found yelling to no. make any situation better no. out there on the water. And yeah. it's, it's the worst thing, really, you that you mad, can do just, as a as a professional. You know, it all bounces back to you. Sure. And, and like like Danny always said, you know, the one thing that you have in this industry is your name. And that's really in life in mm-hmm. general, but in this industry specifically, it's it it sticks to you pretty pretty hard and if you if you tarnish that you got to wear it that label. if that label is is bad then you got to wear it you know still so let me give you a little word of advice if you're new in the guide business if you are going to get labeled do not have a really bright color for like your business theme and don't wear an orange shirt <laughs> yeah. this well this is not mine. <laughs> <laughs> no this is in case you drown they can yeah. find you easier <laughs> but, but. Well, well yeah guys we're gonna um we're gonna talk a little tarpon fishing we're gonna talk about where you may be able to find some tarpon, how you can catch them, and what you can use to catch them. And, and when we get back, we're going to mention the – do we want to go ahead and do trivia now, and then we'll, we'll let them go through break, think about yeah, it. Yeah, great then, idea, Travis. And then we'll – Best uh, one of the week. Man, I'm telling you. <laughs> He's on a roll. So, so Captain James has got yeah. a little trivia for you guys here, and we're going to mention that. And when we get back, guys – we're going to be talking some tarpon fishing, rigs, how-tos, the whole nine yards. So yep. what do we got, James? So whoever gets it first, we got a little kind of tarpon starter pack. We got some hooks, uh, circle hooks, some leader, some fluorocarbon leader, and a couple corks to get you going. Um, so what we want to know, what's the state record tarpon, all tackle record, and then also the world all tackle record. So we're looking for two numbers here, state record all tackle, world record all tackle. Cool. Well, that's it, guys. So you need two of them, mm-hmm. state and world record on tarpon, and uh, you'll get your little tarpon starter pack. We'll be right back, guys. You're watching Tampa Fishing Outfitters Live Fishing Report. We'll see you in just a minute.
And we're back, guys. You're watching Tampa Fishing Outfitters Live Fishing Report. Myself, Captain Travis, Captain Jason, and Captain James. Yep. In the studios, Tampa Fishing Outfitters here off Osborne Avenue, right across from Tampa Bay Buccaneers football stadium. Pretty much. Wouldn't that's say right across. It I'm is. not going to tell you what we're right across from. Well, but, uh, that's the truth. We're close, I was to, trying the, to, we're close <laughs> to the Buck Stadium. I was trying to uh, feather that a little bit. But, yeah, real close to the Buck Stadium, guys, if you, if you haven't been to the store. Tampa Fishing Outfitters is here, St. Pete Fishing Outfitters, and then yep. Tarpon, Tarpon Fishing, Fishing Outfitters. Outfitters yeah. so Three we locations got the, stacked with gear. We got I the mean, trifecta to the second <laughs> to to the second level. You know what's funny about our store? Literally, we're so like we're in this. You know, everybody's gearing up for. Ta I mean, it's fishing's, you know, at peak season right sure. now. Sure. So the traffic we're getting is crazy, and we were looking for one particular tarpon rod that a customer wanted today. And I, we didn't have it here. And I was like, well, let me try St. And I called the manufacturer, St. Croix. Oh, they're sold out here in four weeks. They're sitting at uh, the other store. I'm like, oh, man, I can't believe this. I have to tell the customers. Like, you know what? Let me call the other stores. St. Pete didn't have it. Called Tarpon. Tarpon's got four of them. So now every store is back in stock with it. So it's kind of nice having all those those stores. like That, that. network of. Yeah. of uh, we do that a lot. I use the, was no. it the Tidemaster? Yep. Yep. That's I've got. For. There you're looking go. for an eight foot heavy tide master i've got you I, better get in here and get it there's like two left they're a open. nice tarpon rod yeah. they really are you know what i like about the and, and we're talking about gear nope. i would tell you um i was using and i, I wasn't i am a saint crow guy before a saint crow guy i had the uh, shimano terramars mm -hmm. uh great rod i just didn't like the action on it yeah. the, the 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 heavy that was extra heavy was too heavy on the tip and then the heavy was too light kind of it was like yeah, you needed something well they have the double extra heavy. yeah right. and then the which extra like heavy stick yeah and then your extra heavy which is like yeah. a crab rod but it doesn't have enough yeah like when you hook a serious yeah. fish with that extra heavy like you're like this thing's gonna snap i've got i've got several i think i've got four of the the ones you're talking about with the extra fast tip and i like these for for baits like this throwing these artificials or throwing liveys yeah sure, that's a good uh, where you want a real natural presentation but the, I tell you, the meat sticks that I've got is I went to the Therese, and I've got the eight foot Therese, and those things are solid, man. Yeah. I mean, they don't are. Make that one that you have anymore. I know. That's the problem. Well, and rod, and you know the last two that I bought because I have four of them, and the last two that I bought were the last two that were in this store about probably going on three years ago now, two and a half, two and a half years ago maybe. But they that, were the green ones. Yeah. That uh, that Saint Croix, the heaviest one they make. I don't have the pound size top of my head but it's it's a really good target i it's it's got a good tip mm -hmm. to where you get kind of limber but it's got the backbone of the rod mm -hmm. it's it's a really balanced rod it's not super heavy I'm really impressed on the on the uh, tarpon rods so, so let me ask a question because we're talking tarpon rods and we're going to talk tarpon fishing here in a second but you know growing up or i said you know tar as you grow tarpon fishing i mean we used to go tarpon fishing in the canals with our same stuff who we went snook and red fishing you know and you end up you know, jumping That's 60, 80 pounds. Right. Well, here's where I, here's what I'm saying, though, is like, you know, so when you start, when you're using or when you're targeting those size fish, your normal inshore gear, inshore gear is, is fine as long as you know how to use sure. the, the, the drag systems and you got the right leader and, and whatnot. As you as you grow as a tarpon fisherman, you really start to target bigger fish like we target on our charters. You really need to up the gear. Mm -hmm. And you're looking at somewhere in the neighborhood between a, a five and an 8,000 series, you know, reel. And Depending on manufacturer. To, right, that's what I'm saying. And, and some a little They're bit smaller, some, place, some bigger. But the size of the rod is what I noticed when you start getting serious with tarpon fishing. And a guy once asked me, he goes, well, why don't you just use a seven-foot rod? He's like, what's the big deal when you're tarpon fishing? And I sort of just kind of went with that because that was the norm. You know, you started bumping the size of the rods up. But one of the things is when you bow to that fish and you get that extra foot, you know, You've you're 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 getting a little more forgiveness on that on that um, on that slack of that line when that fish does go to jump, but you're also getting a little more backbone. You're getting a little more retrieve. Um, you can put a little more heat. I feel on those fish by giving you more uh, arch yeah, and that and that rod. You know, really it's an extra foot of tip. and 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 I think that's because those fish dance and go crazy. I think by giving you that extra little bit of um, not really resistance, but give, you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, the give yeah. is what keeps those fish on the line. Yeah. When you put a broomstick out there, a seven-foot grouper, seven grouper rod, yeah. and you're trying to reel these fish in, when they're dancing and jarring and doing backflips, you're going to pop, pop hooks or pop the yeah. line. And so there's a, there's a balance there between the right piece of gear and the wrong piece of gear. Um, also, 
that's what you know people get asked that question all the time and i every you know just about everyone fishes eight foot like they're like they're saying but also when you're in a position and you're not exactly sure where those fish are and then they pop up you know being able to cast it that eight foot rod right with an eight foot rod can make a big difference i've seen well that 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 it's you know uh throwing a thread fin too with with the corks um floats whatever you want to call them that having a limber tip like them extra extra heavy dude throwing a crab with them things on the beach it's yeah it's you don't have enough weight just well there's not enough kind of you know not not a whip into it like you, you're trying to get a kind of you know if you got the cork set you got to kind of do your little round thing and swing swing around having that extra rod just gives an extra cast um i tell you i'm not the best with these and casting me neither there's a technique to it and i can do it okay but there are a few guys out there that and that people may not understand why now these aren't the weighted ones i like the weighted yeah. ones but and people may not understand what you're talking about because you know most people would think, say, an inshore rig, you've only got, you yeah, know, you 20, 24 inches of, feet, of line between the, mm-hmm. the cork and the hook. You're talking five feet sometimes, six feet. I've yeah. seen guys throw them from the tower yeah. you know, where, you, where you whip them around and throw them from the tower. And so that's what we mean by being difficult to throw with the cork because you traditionally will put this bait a lot further down from the cork yeah. than you would, say, fishing redfish, snook, or trout. And, and so it can get a little difficult, and there's definitely some, some tricks to getting – and fishing those baits and getting them out there. Well, but I'm uh, one thing about the the uh, new boat is I've got the rods on the tower, kind of an angle for like going across the beach, having your crabs set up mm-hmm. in the tower. I never had that on my canyon baits. I don't know why I never had them put. It. I just wouldn't think of it during tarpon season. I'm like, well, on the hard top too, it was very hard because there was no aluminum right structure on the sides from the weld the rod on. Mm-hmm. So actually, on the rod up there this year is gonna be nice because you get on the beach, you get a tower. You know, you, you got your crab in the bucket you, you or need something. You yeah, need a pitch rod. Yeah, you need rod. a pitch rod. So I finally got something set up where it's going to be easier. So um, fishing the beach is awesome. I am a I love fishing the passes in the beach. Uh, it's been a hard adapt for me. I, I've caught fish at the bridge. I get the bridge. For whatever reason, me and the bridge, just, you know, <laughs> just, I don't know. You got structure. Impatient then, Preto. Impatient Preto. The, uh, That's what I'm calling. The, the hey, look, fish. if he sits there for more than 20 minutes and yeah. doesn't see a fish or yeah. hook a fish, dude, I got, we got to okay, move. We got to move. We got to move. We got to find him. There he but goes. I'm to be honest with you. The more time <laughs> I spend talking to you, the more I realize I'm closer to his style. Yeah. Like, I was at the bridge the other day, and I didn't see a fish for 20 minutes. Like, well, they'll pop up, but you, you at least need to see them. Yeah. They're there. And sometimes they are there. I've trust me. I've spent seven hours at that bridge, and yeah, and it's just work. It's not. It's not impatience. It's the aggravation between the pinfish and now the dolphins. Like they, they've all stepped their game up. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. To where if you, you know, if oh, you're yeah. chunking at them, it, it's frustrating. I, you know, fishing the beach is just, it's more, when it works, it's more enjoyable. Well, there's and there's two styles of tarpon fishing, which which we'll talk about. You know, you get your run and gun style where you're trying to look for fish and actually more of a sight fish. Yeah. type scenario as opposed to sitting in an area and waiting for the fish to come to you or for the fish to turn on that are in your area yeah. you know yeah. you can chum them to you uh and and you may pull up to an area the bridge is one of those where you can pull up to the bridge at certain times of the year on certain tides and you won't see a fish you yeah. won't mark a fish there will be nothing it'll look like a ghost town and all of a sudden those fish will pour in you know, from from the channels or laid off on the side of the rock piles, and they'll pour in and start feeding under the bridge, and so it's a pattern thing for the guys that that for the guys that are really good at tarpon fishing. It's not that they can hook a fish or land a fish. It's knowing where to be and when to be yeah, there and tiny. what to be fishing mm-hmm. with, because tarpon in particular are very tied. They move a lot in in pointing that tide driven. You know. There's guys that, that and, I, and I know because we'll, we'll do the same thing where you'll follow the fish through the tide. You know, the bridge is a perfect example. I don't want to go too into detail, but there's a lot of guys that will fish the bridge first and work their way out on the hill tide mm-hmm. towards the beach. You know, fish the holes, well, I, fish, I the, believe fish that the channels. Some of them fish, too, will and bounce back and forth between, like, say, the inside of Egmont and the bridge. Right. Because I've caught them. When you catch them in between, it's awesome. 100%. Like, there's a big old wad of fish just going nuts in, in the middle. And, yeah. you know. But you're right. I think them schools of fish. I think you got some singles that may stay. Right. I mean, there's. But I, I think there's fish that bounce around, and that's as a whole. As it a whole. gets tough with tarpon. Do you sit and wait them out and throw the goose egg, or do you go? Because I'll be thinking in my head, man, I bet you these fish are on the beach, and I'll be oh, sitting, yeah. and I'm just beating myself up. Yep. So yeah. I gotta go run to the beach to just. 
find out they're there. Yeah. But I've found a lot of times I had to run back and just wait. Them. It's it's a game of chess. It's, it's it is. A, it's a hard game of chess to play. And um, what what makes going with a guide better is that typically the guide knows what the what they did the day before, and that is key with almost every fish, so to speak, but especially with tarpon, knowing, okay, yesterday they came right at the top of the tide. They rolled in the pass around the southwest corner, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But having that that the having that guess guess a little better than somebody just hadn't been all week is, is makes it easier. You get – I mean, you know, that's what I'm saying. My tarpon trips are spread out. It's a little bit more work because – if I got them lined up, then I say, "All right, well, I know yesterday about right. this time it happened." So. And they're and they're and they stay on pattern too. I mean, they'll move around the the tide cycles, around the moon cycles. But here, and I would say the next couple of weeks, I think the fish will be a little more patternable coming off of this new moon. I think the fish are going to move in, and hopefully, if we get some good weather that doesn't blow these fish out, like traditionally yeah. will happen, the fish will sort of get in a pattern, and and I think tarpon and fishing will be good over the next month, yeah. at least over the next moon cycle. And then for me, I like doing the late tarpon thing. I mean, I, I really enjoy fishing later in the season, late July, August, is, is when I really enjoy tarpon fishing, when most people are burnt out and there's still quite a few fish around. But um, before we go any farther about spots and areas, let's talk a little bit about what we got here in front of us. Right. Do we have a winner? Not Well, we're I was Chris, uh, uh, we're checking with you, buddy. We we looking for – well, there's also some more people that have joined, so – Let's shout out shout out trivia again, yeah. Trivia question again for the Tarpon Gear Starter Pack. We're looking for the all tackle world record and the all tackle state record. Florida state record. Yeah, I saw somebody give a crack at the world record, but we're looking for both. So if you haven't um if you haven't uh answered yet, Google's on. Right Get on, on it. Get on it. <laughs> so for Tarpon for Tarpon this is, I would say, probably the most basic setup that I would, I'd say, 90% of people follow is you've either got a 60 to 80 pound braid main line. I prefer spin and tackle. I think it's a little more comfortable for me and a little bit more typically comfortable for the clients. Typically, your um, conventionals though, if you start uh, chunking where you're not it's casting, a, it's a different. You put, they got more drag. You're gonna yeah. you're gonna you be able to put more heat and you're gonna be able to land fish a lot quicker on yeah. conventional setup, but. I per, I, like, I like I'm I like I like to yeah I like to use the spinning gear. I mean, if you've ever backlashed a, a rod and reel, you know, try putting one in the client's hand. And I've had yeah. that happen with you know several times, especially one in mine. especially when you get bit <laughs> yeah. and you let a client drop one down or somebody that hasn't used conventional gear and you get bit immediately and that thing's still in free spool. Oh and yeah, you you blow it up. Now you but ruin the bite and the <laughs> yeah, it can be tough. But anyway, it, it it's definitely a good way to fish tarpon. I'm not saying it's not, but we're gonna talk spinning gear. Or actually, it doesn't matter from the braid down. You can have whatever you want on the end. But 60-pound leader is normally where I start. Sometimes I'll go down to 40. Sometimes I'll bump up to 80. But 60-pound fluorocarbon leader, this is a Hero brand fluorocarbon leader. You can buy this in 50-yard uh, spools. Just or the 25, 50, or 200. Or the 200, yeah. Uh, I like 200 the 200-yard spools are nice for us. Um, they a little pricey, but, you know, the line really don't go bad unless you really keep it that long. Um I just – well, the problem with the 60, 60 and the 200 is a pretty big spool. Yeah. So to fit on your spool thing on your boat, it's a little tough. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, the, the – I will tell you this for me, uh, my experience with tarpon, uh, we've actually downsized to 50 before. And I, my saying on the boat, it's better to lose the fish and not get bit. Yes. So sometimes tarpon have eyeballs about that big. So they can see real good um, – Messing with your tackle a little bit. If you're on some fish and they're not moving, they won't eat. I'm not going to say it's going to make it better, but change up your leader a little bit. Do some. Uh, me and Clay were out there a few years back, and I remember he went down to 40, and I was like, "What's the point?" Mm -hmm. But he flew a couple fish, right. and, and there was no chance. I mean, these, you know, these were beach fish that are going 100 plus. But uh, oh, it can be done. They can. Definitely I have be yet done. to see him land on forty. Everybody. <coughs> no, I mean you can. I mean guys landing them on fly all the time. Yeah. It's not. It's all the drag system thing. You well, know? with I mean, clients, it it's can not be a, done. It's not I, a, uh, I get it, but but you know, uh, it, it you know we went down done. to forty, and I think he went down to thirty one day just because we were on aggravated. Yeah, at that bite, point, aggravated yeah. fish. But, a lot of uh, times the weight of the fish breaks it off when they jump. Yeah. Point point being, we hooked. Yeah, <laughs> we hooked them on. So changing your leader up is 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 minor as it sounds. It does work, and and being kind of. I would point this to you, technical at times. 
uh, which probably makes you a pretty good tarpon fisherman, is, is di dissecting what you're dealt with. If you didn't get bit on a day, uh, it's very frustrating. We've all been frustrated. We've all zeroed out on tarpon. But try to figure out, okay, why did I get bit? And then mm. if you got a chance to go the next day, kind of bring something a little different in your arsenal, whether it's crab, whether it's cut bait. The biggest obstacle with bait or with, with tarpon to me is – bait like acquiring it all yeah you, it all. you need yeah. like Having i tell everything. people like yeah. i feel like when i leave the dock i really want some cut bait i want some live bait i want my crabs but sometimes to get all that and then run if you're yeah. running i mean i'm running two, two six trips hour right? tarpon trips and i'm going to bed at nine o'clock at night and can't even get the crabs like some days you just got to roll what you got but yeah. if you can have a a mixture of different bait um it, it'll increase your odds because you know travis uh one year you were hot on a on a on some cut dead stuff on the bottom, and I remember the next year you were struggling because he he called me and said, "Man, I can't get things to eat." And he said, "I'm getting some crabs." And dude went out there with a little headlight and got a few crabs, and they were eating crab. Mm -hmm. Same spot, same pretty mm -hmm. much fish. Mm -hmm. They were just that's what they want. That's what they wanted. So yeah, that's why you want all all three or four it, times. It's, yeah, it's yeah. the tarpon fishery is definitely a hodgepodge fishery. Mm -hmm. But what I what I wanted is so so we talked about the leader. And so you've got, you know, a 60-pound fluorocarbon leader. Tie whatever, you know, terminal knot you like. Yeah. You know, I, I prefer, honestly, still at this point, a double uni. Me too. Uh, I have had no issues with it. A lot of guys will tie an FG knot, um, which is fine. But any any knot that you choose on the line-to-line, -line, mm -hmm. five to six foot of fluorocarbon leader. And depending on the size of the bait and what you're using is when you pick your hook. Oh. You know, you can go down to a pretty small hook when you're crab fishing, especially past crabs, and they're and they're smaller. You definitely don't want to put an eight-dot circle hook in a in a two and a half inch past crab. Yeah, you're just not gonna get it done. Mm -hmm. So you really need to size the hooks for that. I would say nothing smaller than a a five-dot is generally where I would sit in tarpon fishing. There are times like if you're fishing for some juvenile fish, or they're getting picky, especially with crabs. Or live baits, where you can drop down to, you know, say a, even a four out circle Strong hook. Four out. But I would say that that five to six range, and most manufactured brands will put you right where you need to be when you're crab fishing or live bait fishing, yeah. whether it's a live pilchard or a live thread fin. Yeah, um, and, and and on hooks, uh, don't cheap it on hooks, man. Uh, tarpon, you, you need kind of a thinnish wire hook. I'm a Daiichi guy. And a wide gap. You need a wide gap and, and a thinnish uh, wire hook. So you need something that's that's made out of good metals mm -hmm. because you're really you're, – you're, <laughs> you're putting a lot of tension on a thin wire hook, so you need something that's good. Um, like I said, I use a lot of Daiichi. What knot, what knot do you boys tie? Say you're tarpon fishing – you're going to fish a live crab. You come down with 60. Mm -hmm. You come to a hook, and you're at, let's say, a 5 watt. you got some smaller crabs. What knot are you going to put on the terminal end of this? When I leave the dock, everything's typically snelled. Um That's how I am. You know, like, and it's not I, – I don't do that because it's like it takes a long time to do, but I'll, I'm pretty meticulous in leaving with 60. Everything's snelled. That's how I start the day. Let the fish tell me to uh, adjust up, down, or not type. I will say that when I get some crab sometimes or sometimes some live bait, I have this habit of if I don't get, you know, if I'm, if I'm not seeing that bite that I want to get, I've gone to some different style loop knots loop knot. to make that bait be able to free, uh, swim a little freer. Um, I can't prove that it's worked, but I still do it over after these years of, of right. doing it, you know, where I'll still jump to that knot if I want to make that bait or that crab appear a little more natural. Um, but I really do the snell uh for the hook set yep. mostly um not because it makes my bait look good or, no or it, you no know, i do anything for that so i, I always yeah. ask because there's not many guys that'll snell knots right and there's times where i'll do it inshore just to just to do it i mean yeah. there's rot not really a necessity to it but i will say that you know circle hooks especially where you have a straight shank hook even though it's a circle hook where it comes down straight and then you've got you know an inline circle hook mm -hmm. Gamagatsu, whether it's VMC, whether it's Daiichi, they're all they're all pretty similar. But when you tie that knot and you put that snell on there, when you go to pull the tension on that hook, you're pulling on the shaft of the hook, right. which is the most efficient way to set a circle hook is when you pull directly on the shaft of the hook. So sometimes with a loop knot, 
you know, the line may actually be turned over to the side or caught yeah. around the side. And when yep. you go to lay the hook in him, sometimes that hook's not set just the way you want it to when you when you pull your line taunt. And so an offshore or, or bottom fisherman kind of taught me that, and he watches our show, Captain Dan Zero with Second Nature Charters down in Key West. And we would always bottom fish with him, and he was adamant about Snell and the circle hooks. And I kind of asked him one day, I was like, well, what's the big deal? And he goes, that's why. You know, he's like, because it, when you're vertical on that fish or when you're 200 and some odd feet down, you want to make sure that when you get that line tight that you're pulling the shank of that hook to yeah. stick it in the corner of that fish's mouth. Absolutely. And true or not true, I, I really couldn't tell you, but I feel more comfortable. Heard it enough times from enough good fish. Right. Fishermen. I've heard it enough good times, and, and I've had success with it. So generally I'll snell a circle hook, uh, especially tarpon fishing or bottom fishing. But there are guys that will use a loop knot and are still successful, and I think mainly because of the action that you get with the bait. You know, when you yeah. put that that loop knot in there, it lets that bait work a little free. It, you know, it, you get a little more action out of it. The one thing that I will say, and, and I'm going to let you chime in on that, Jason, is the one thing that scares me, particularly with tarpon on a loop knot, is wear through. Yeah. You know, I mean, I've seen it where we're snook fishing, and I'll sometimes I'll tie loop knots on just for the heck of it. And... A lot of times you'll wear through that knot if you're not paying close attention to it over the course of three or four fish. And with tarpon, you know, hooking a fish is part of the battle. Once half. you get them, yeah, you know, half. or, or yeah. half the battle. Half the battle is trusting your gear, having the right knots, having the right, you know, drag on the reel, getting the boat in the right place. Uh, there's a lot more after getting the fish hooked. And over the years, especially getting hired to do it and getting paid, I try to eliminate all those little things like, you know, I see guys tarpon fishing with swivels, and I'm like, why? Yeah. I mean, you know, the knots we use these days are, are just as tough as any swivel. And for me, I want to eliminate anything in between that client and that fish yeah, that, that is not wrong. needed. Mm -hmm. And so those are some of the things that, that I do. But So generally, like I said, we'd have the, the knot from the main line, 60, 80-pound braid, 60 pound fluorocarbon leader down to a five, six, sometimes even an eight dot circle hook if we're cut baiting. And that's why I wanted to bring up these little guys right here, which are half in, or half ounce egg sinkers, slip sinkers. And this is something that you guys probably don't wouldn't do as much as I do, but I, I like cut bait fishing a lot, especially inside the bay. And there are times where this half inch egg sinker right here makes all the difference in the world when you're cut baiting or if you're going to put a live bait down on the bottom. Mm -hmm. A lot of times I'll take and, and do a little bit of both. I'll have, whether it's cut mullet, cut threadfin, cut ladyfish, cut pinfish, something on the bottom, and I'll have a live bait real close to it as well, and I'm using those half-ounce leads. And part of the reason is is there's times where inside the bay, the fish don't feed on the surface, or I'd say middle column up, as much as they will from the middle column down. Mm -hmm. Uh, these are trash can fish. These are up inside the channels. They're moving around. There's not really a lot for them to come up and feed on at certain times, whereas the beach fish have got all different types of things, or even the bridge fish have got things They're crossing them all the time. The They're looking the beach, to They're feed. Typically on the surface. Yeah. And so a lot of times you're doing a little bit different you know, theory where you're bringing more fish to you or trying to get close to the fish and get them to, to go to the baits and Sometimes putting a little bit of lead on there will make all the difference in the world keeping that bait on the bottom. So that's that's one of the little things that I'll do when I'm when I'm cut bait fishing. And then the lures, why don't you bring us in on those, Jay? Because yeah. I know you like to throw quite a bit of artificials at tarpon, and um, we got a couple co good ones yeah. here that we can. Something I've done a lot in the past. I mean, um, you know, so we get asked. That's probably our number one question in the month of May is like, what are some good lures for tarpon? Right. And I mean, you could probably ask. 10 different great fishermen and they'll get 10 different great answers but the one thing so i'm at the that, bait shop yeah, right the bait shop. <laughs> but one thing that's you know usually in they everyone's answer has in common the doa bait buster in the trolling model right um works great in the open works great around bridges um at night during the day you know you're kind of just adjusting your color you know, any, any mullet color patterns, the black and gold, the black and silver, the purple. I picked natural. this purple one out because this is probably one of my favorites. Yeah, man, I love it. Purple Demon. But dude. it just gets a good action. It's a good weight. I think it's one and a quarter or one and a half ounce on the trolling model. One ounce, sorry, one ounce. And um, that tail, man, just 
goes wild. Gets with it. Goes wild. Kingfish, Spanish mackerel, bonitas, mm-hmm. jacks, uh, anything that is in that area yeah. will, and, and it's feeding on the surface will take one of these baits, man. And they're and they're great. And they cast we, well. They cast well. Mm-hmm. Now, I will say that a lot of times, and people will ask me because I'll normally have a casting rod on the boat set up with something like this, just in case that fish or pod shows up next to you and you're not really set up for it you can make a throw at a fish Mm -hmm. and a lot of times i'll still keep the 60 pound braid when i'm throwing these bigger bait busters out there you know while we're tarpon fishing and some people ask me and part of the reason is is when that fish hits a lot of times on these baits and you're reeling in you know it's pretty intense oh yeah the shock (laughs) is is crazy and so over the years i used to fish 40 on my on my artificial baits like this and I, I started breaking fish off when because it was so right. aggressive, that so initial. violent that they, we were busting that 40-pound leader, and so I bumped up to 60. And I think it affects the bite a little bit. Like, I don't, I don't think it's quite as uh, attractive. Mm-hmm. But when they're feeding heavily and, they're, and they're, the guard's down, yeah. it's one of those balance betweens. And so that question got asked in a seminar the other night, what size leader do you use if you're doing artificial? And a lot of times I'll still use that 60-pound, yeah. you know, 40 to 60, but – it, it'll still work and then the next one we got here this is a relatively relatively new yeah, product is. here the savage gear crab mm-hmm. yeah so it's yeah it's not not uh overly new but it's starting to get a little more play and there's a little it's more pretty cool i like the right. claws and all it that looks on. great i mean it's a good looking crab you know compared to a lot of what you've seen the berkeley out there. gulp crab man that thing looks yeah they're peeler like crabs a, and right. stuff like that this is they're they're trying to imitate blue crabs and um, I Baby think they're pushing, blue. The, yeah, they're pushing the envelope and there are some other companies that are smaller companies that have some things in the works too, that I think when it comes to tarpon and artificial crab come around, I cast, you're going right. to see some things that you say, I'll throw that at a, uh, at a tarpon. Cause I the, didn't really, the see real that. question is, will the tarpon eat will it? Tarpon <laughs> eat it? <laughs> right. Most and, crabs I pick up. I and the, and the, I tell you, the biggest thing about some of this stuff is, um, if you look at the traditional tarpon setup, live bait, cut bait setup, you don't have the same thing going here. Mm. You don't have a circle hook on here. Mm-hmm. You got all this other stuff in the way from getting in the way of the jawbone or the, the clipper on the fish to get yeah. it set. And then is this is this equipment going to be strong enough to, what we're to to catch a big tarpon? And I think improvements of that have, have made these types of baits yeah. more successful, not only the way they look, you know, and the appearance they have when they float. And – Crab fishing to me is probably one of the best ways to target tarpon if you find them in their feeding. It's cool. Because you can literally watch them come up and eat the crabs. I mean, sometimes when they're on bait schools, you'll see them rolling mm-hmm. or doing the old backflip. But crab fishing is definitely when the crabs are flowing and there's fish around and and you're there at the right time, you're going to see these fish slurping crabs yeah. coming up, popping Hear them. and letting the guard down. Yeah. Hear them. And so from an artificial perspective, you know, I've always thought that on some level, art of, you have sort of an advantage fishing artificial on top water because the fish is only getting the index of, or, right. you know, the, the visual, the, the silhouette of what's silhouette. on the surface. And so that's all you have to match. For the most part, then you have action and speed and everything else. But well, you know, fish, I think you could really fool a tarpon on I'd one like of these crabs, man. I'm not an artificial guy with with tarpon. I, to me, I think they're hard hard enough to, yeah. alone to catch on live bait. But um, that thing actually looks like a crab. I mean, a lot of the stuff I've seen that's artificial, it's it just you know they're they're relying on relying off scent and stuff like that. It just doesn't. That actually looks real. But um, I tell you that. Tarpon fishing, there's a bunch of different ways um, to do it. And, and like you said, one of my favorite would have to be the crab drifts. It, it's just uh, it's an experience. It's a really neat experience. It's crowded the last few years out there. But there's something about rolling out there in the afternoon, you know, get the music playing. You bring your kids out there. The kids have fun catching crabs. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's an experience. It really is. Catching a, a, a tarpon is a bonus. As a guide, there's a lot of headaches involved. You typically have a strong outgoing tide uh, with a west wind, mm-hmm. getting the correct drift, getting your baits not to be on the surface, getting the clients to open the bell, close the bell as needed. Um, it's quite the headache. But like you said, sometimes when that bite goes off out there, it, it is it is it is. A, if you haven't seen it when it goes off, it's pretty neat, man. The yeah. crabs show up. 
they start slurping and, and people are just bowed up and, and it's it's really fun um the in-between stuff it, it as a guide it, it it's really challenging because you keep drifting and, and to me you pick your drift you pick an outside drift you pick an inside drift you pick a middle drift on the pass uh where are the fish at you you, you only kind of know by reading your machine and and then fish move a lot out there they're coming in and out with the tides they're slurping so <clears throat> it's a lot of work and, and i think the the biggest like I said, the biggest issue is dealing with uh, getting a good drift, especially a boat like yours, Loud Tower, is a benefit out there. Yeah. Because uh, the oh, wind, yeah. mm-hmm. I would literally be next to a boat like yours, and I'm running into them every time. I have to, I have to motor up and leave because we're just yeah. running into each other because my bo- and we're doing the same drift. Yeah. Here's out of there's times where I'll leave my motor in reverse to get a good drift, to pull the boat out with the tide. Right. And just tell them, look, guys, when your line gets tight, open the bail because your crabs are just going to come to the surface. Just common sense, but it, it is challenging as a guide because there's a lot of guys that just they get lazy out there. It gets kind of boring for a while, and they sit just down. sit there, and the rod's sitting there. I'm like, well, you're not making this any easier. So that's um, the that's the tough part about <sighs> crab fishing. I mean, and you know, like what I've tried to do over the years is, and it's hard. It's all about pattern and fish. And I think our business in general is all about knowing where to be, when to be there, and and tarpon is no exception. You know, and so for me, like if when I do my tarpon trips, we may end up inside the bay on a slack tide or, you know, when those crabs aren't flushing or when the bite's not hot and then sort of transition out and work our way out to do some of that because generally it's not an all-day thing. You know, it's not like, hey, tomorrow it's the full moon and it's going to be awesome. It's not going to be 12 hours of just awesomeness throwing a bait out there and, and they, they eat every time, you know, and so – that's really the tricky part about tarpon fishing is, you know, knowing when those fish are going to feed. And prepping. Knowing, knowing how to read the fish. And prepping um, your clients to what you're and, doing. And, prep, and prepping your clients. A lot of people go, I want to go tarpon fishing. Like, okay, this is what we're going to have to do. Yeah. And it's going to be boring, and then all hell's going to break loose is what I tell them. Um, there's another thing that we don't have on the table that I use, um, and I didn't think about grabbing them. Tampa Fishing Outfitters has some really big split shots. Right. That are almost – they got to be almost half inch. Yeah, I can't remember what ounce. size. Yeah, half or so yeah, half inch, half ounce. I know we got uh, three eighths. I yeah, think we have half I'll buy the biggest ones they have, and uh, sometimes if I'm doing a drift and to get that crab down, and it's worked. Like, been next to people, and I'll slip a split shot on, and all of a sudden I fly a fish, and you know, somebody, hey man, what'd you have on? Throw a split shot on. You're getting that bait down. Sometimes that's all. That's yeah. all it you takes. Just gotta that kind of figure out where that fish. Yeah, the be little the stuff zone. matters. Be in the strike zone, man. Little stuff that's, matters. Put the bait in the strike zone. And, and you'll and increase one thing your I want to add before you go over that, guys, if you haven't been out there and you say, man, I want to go out there and tarpon fish, you got a boat. It's not a lot of rocket science. There's a lot of secrets to help you catch fish. But really go out there if it's your first time in the past. And, and there's going to be a lot of commotion, and it can be overwhelming for a new guy. Um, sit back just with your kids or whoever's on the boat and, and kind of watch some people and see what they're doing on a drift. You know, mm-hmm. you don't want a short drift. You don't want to cut people's drift off. You have to remember some people have – 50 yards of line out sometimes on a drift. Try not to anchor in the pass. Yeah, well, that's that's going to happen. Dropping it, it depends on where you are, but that that's kind of an old school rule of don't do it, but it, that, that you're not going to stop. But just on your drifts, especially on your hill tides, kind of pay attention to the boats, uh, what they're doing. Kind of follow suit. Not saying go with everybody else, but you don't want to jump in there and just start messing the whole thing up. So that And that's a common problem. And, and like I said, I think it's half of it, just people – not really knowing. Don't understand. Yeah, you know, they're like, oh, look, nope. there's fish right there, and they jump right in front of the boat that's drifting. When well, that's really, by the time you get your line there, half the time where they stop, they've already went over the fish because the tide is deceiving out there. You're blowing through them passes, mm-hmm. and you don't realize it not unless you look at the shore, and you're like, man, I just passed the, the dock cow, out there yeah. at Egmont. Yeah. So, you know, kind of look at people, get an eye on it. Uh, you know, hire a guide. I, we're guides, and we do tarpon fishing. You don't want to hire us. There's plenty of other guides out there. Maybe spend the money if you have it to, to hire a guide and, and get the bases. You'll learn more on that boat than you will yeah. uh, trying it on your own. You'll probably save a few bucks, too, when you figure your gas and time. So uh, one thing I wanted to add because it's a common problem. No, 100%. And, and you're right, man. I mean, it, um, every year this comes up, and it's it's just like snook fishing. It's just like if there was a school of redfish. It really just boils down to ethics and, and being respectful to everybody the, out there. You're going to take a lot of people. You're going to put them in a relatively small area all after the same exact thing. The difference and, on the and beach so between snook and, and tarpon is there's about six spots that everybody's kind of right. hitting. Now, you got your stuff in the bay. It's a little different. Where snook, you got 
20 spots. So you can kind of just move to the next spot if you're – you, you're kind of hit, you know, especially on your hilltide. You, you're kind of hitting the same stuff, and I think that's where the frustration level gets a little higher. So my theory on this is, hey, educate the guys not to cut you off. But yeah, you're right. It's, I mean, it's most all the of it, most of it, most bit. of it is common sense when you start thinking about it. Not necessarily from the point of catching fish, but if you go to do something that you've never done, and there's people out there yeah. doing it. You sit back and you watch. And, you, are. you know, you go, oh well, okay, whatever. Nine times out of ten, a lot of guys will say. Hey man, you know, come up in here. Or you'll you'll pick it out. I mean, not everybody's a out there to to have a bad day. I mean, I can tell you that it happens to me all the time where I, people go, "What what was just happening?" Yeah. I'm flying. Out, I'm out here flying tarpon. The guy had no clue. Pulled up next to me and was trolling grouper plugs and, or something. And you know, and if you're and a lot guy, of times they'll they'll go on around you or you know, hey man, sorry, you know, this that and the other. If rather than that, losing your lid. If you're that guy out there that's flying fish, don't hook four fish on one boat. It, it's I, I know you think that it's cool and, and you're showing off in front of all their boats. Go through the system, man. It, it, you can't enjoy four tarpon on at once. I mean, it is a little cool, but when you got other people that – if you don't screw nobody else up, that's right. fine. But there's too many times in there where where people just – they get a fish that runs 300 yards across the pass, and there's, they've got them in some kind of chum slick or they got them behind the boat. And they just start getting greedy to, to, to show off. And I don't know. I just don't I don't like that. My, my theory is on the boat, guys, we're not doing that. We're going to hook one fish. We're going to follow that Get fish. Get the lines in. We're going we're gonna to try to actually land fish. this fish. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not going to fly 15 fish and, and not get any to the boat because we were getting greedy. And, and it messes other people up, if it, especially if it's crowded out there. And, and it depends. I mean, you're, you're pointing more towards the pass fishing. And the, yeah, I am. And I the am. high well, congested, that's the, that's the high the, congested yeah. areas. The bay, you, you know? don't really have that problem. That's it's, what I'm it's a little by yourself and you want to hook four fish and lose them, because chances are even by yourself you're not going to land. They're all going to go opposite ways. Yeah, that's right. You know, so th that's fine. But, you know, when you get around other people, I just I see it a lot, and it, it's, it's frustrating to, to see that, you know, because they're screwing other people's fishing up. Well, it stems right into our, our final and – Last little item right there, and that's an anchor ball. Um, I know a lot of people have them, but this is the one tool when you're tarpon fishing. If you don't have a product like a Rodan or a, a GPS anchor trolling mm -hmm. motor, this is the one thing that you're going to want to pick up when you come into Tampa Fishing Outfitters along with your gear is a good anchor ball. And I like the bigger ones. They do make a smaller one, but I, I like the little bit bigger ones, and, I, and I'll tell you why. Because you can see them a little bit better at night, and you can hit them with a flashlight. During the day, you can you can see most of the balls. But you know, if if you get serious about tarpon fishing, and you fish this season, there's there's going to be a time where you're fishing that hill tide, and you hook up just before dark, or you know, at dark, and you fight that fish through the you know yeah. through the dark hours, the and you got to go back and find your anchor. Well, and this is one thing that'll help you be able to do that. But also, you'll be able to get out of the way. Get on your fish. Get on top of your fish. You don't have to pull the anchor in. You don't want to try to pull your anchor in. You're probably going to lose your fish. Um, but you're also saving your spot. And that's another thing, too, is, you know, if, if you're out there tarpon fishing and you pull into an area. That's most and, important, saving and, your spot. <laughs> and, and you see, I mean, unfortunately, that's yeah. just how it is. But if you see right. a guy's Sorry, anchor. Sorry, bug. I get my anchor. It's my anchor, buddy. If you see an anchor ball out yeah. there, you know, um, know that at some point, somebody's going to be coming back to that spot yeah. and get back on where, where they were fishing. So, uh, I'll something tie that, my boat off on it and just hold it for them. And, and we'll know. do that. I mean, there was a time last year where I happened to be chumming some fish, and I think it was you. I flew, I jumped on a fish, I and, on and I said, ball. just go to my anchor ball while we're fighting the fish. I said, of course, don't I've, go to a stranger's I've got anchor an, ball. I've got yeah, an yeah, hour. Thinking, you know, I've got an hour guy. on this <laughs> fish. But, um, but anyhow, so this does help. Yeah. It's going to help you get out of the way quicker. And a lot of times what I'll do is once I get set, once I get set on anchor where I want to be, if I'm anchored up, is I'll take the anchor line, put it through here, and I'll go ahead and coil up the rest of the anchor line that I have left. And I'll buy those, or I've got those uh, Velcro straps. Yeah. And I'll go ahead and I'll strap the rest of my anchor line that's left to the buoy right here, and I'll have it laying on the deck. And the second we fly a fish or get hooked up, I take that, I go right off the cleat, and this whole thing just goes overboard in a matter of seconds. See, I know, tried that, seconds. and the Velcro straps want to come off on me when they get wet. Well, I, Which I, ones are you using? I'm, I'm using actually using the ones from West Marine. Really? That's and, the ones I, I tried that for whatever They've reason. been solid. We I got people tell us all the time. They take them off their old leader. 
things. The, like on the, the bigger yeah. ones, yeah. Any, Depends any on how much rope you have. But yeah, I mean, I if, if you're serious about it, you can even take a big zip tie. That's what I once use. You have zip it tie set, and then yeah. just, just go ahead and zip tie the rest of your anchor line mm. to this. I keep a big pack and, on the boat. And, and the point of this is, is that you don't have anchor line all strung out yeah. there, yeah. you know, or below it or whatever. And you you pull up to that anchor ball, you take a gaff or a or a dock, you know, post pull and grab the anchor and get back on your anchor. So I'll tell you too, the bigger the anchor ball, the better. Right. Um, because like you, you were saying, night. I when you, it, it's different out in the passes. I I've got a big one like this, and it like we hooked a fish. Uh, it was a, in the afternoon when that west wind kicks up, and like we hooked them on the edge of the pass. We were anchored up right on the edge, and we were just sticking. And we had the, ch we had that line of fish just coming down, mm -hmm. and I chucked my anchor, and I was way out where the waves were breaking. Well, we ended up way in the pass, and we got done, and it took me. I had to. I couldn't see, and I had a big one. I had to go on my GPS trail to find my anchor. Like, I'm looking, I'm going. Yeah, it'll happen. That thing, and You'll it looked like a little BB out around. there, and I had yeah. the big old orange one. So don't use a small anchor ball, especially if right. you're fishing in the afternoons, because when the waves start breaking out there, you just can't. So I, I almost, like, I had to go twice, on my GPS. So I would love my anchor. last year, and I think I said it on, on a previous show, is uh, I got a bunch of uh, glow sticks. And when when we were out there and knew we were going to be fishing, because we did some some full moon snapper fishing and tarpon mm -hmm. fishing, all sort of knew we were going to be out late. And I would always bring some glow sticks with me Throw and zip tie the glow stick yeah. to there. Once it started getting dark, I just put a put a uh, glow stick on there to help me get it back because I'm not really fond of buying two hundred dollar sea claw anchors. No. And and uh, I yeah. like to get my. We're stuff fond back, of selling so. them though. <laughs> yeah. If I need yeah. one. If we need. <laughs> well, guys, but I think we're gonna wrap the show up here. Travel on. The well, yep. tell them about the seminar out. next week because you yeah, guys are gonna be back. We're right. actually talking tarpon here. Uh, me and Travis are gonna be doing a uh, seminar. This should be somewhat comical because we tend to argue a lot, but uh, you will get some good information out of it. Um, you'll probably get two different perspectives. In the meantime, but that's going to be next Wednesday at what time? Six thirty. Six thirty at the. We're going to be shop. doing the show right before. I think we're going to try. We're going to we're going to play with it a little bit. We'll probably end up if if we don't try to get some live footage of the actual seminar. What we'll do is we'll record it mm -hmm. and put together you know a video that we'll we'll load up maybe. Okay. But what we'll do is maybe just do a, a little small show. Yeah. You know maybe six. We'll try to get in here a few minutes early and do a show from like six to six thirty. Maybe do a little half hour show. And then we're going to fall into Well, I only the, got a four-hour trip, so we can get in here at like 4.30 or something to pull a whole show together. If you're, if you're, I don't know what your schedule is, but we'll see what our we'll schedule is. Yeah, we we'll, we'll, we'll figure it all out, you know. Maybe we'll just start Already at noon. Start yeah. We'll just start at noon. We'll just start be interesting it. is what we're saying. <laughs> Live, son, the whole day we're going to be doing the show. Y'all are tired it. of seeing us. Yeah. Hey, if y'all like to do a tarpon trip with us, beers. Uh, local knowledge fishing, Captain James Beers. It's 813-625-2067. Captain Travis, it's Instinct Fishing Company, 813-830-3474, or you can visit my website, www.fishbyinstinct.com. And Steady Action Fishing Charters, Captain Jason, 813-727-9890, or you can get me on my website, steadyactionfishingcharters.com. Cool. Guys, we appreciate it. We'll see you next week. Like I said, get your tarpon questions ready. Or come up here to the seminar at 630, yeah. Tampa Fishing Outfitters, and we'll uh, we'll do our best to get them answered. Guys, we appreciate your time, and we will see you next week. Good deal.